Chapter 13, The Road to Redemption. It's been a while since we talked about John Jones. Where last we left you, John had been forced off of UFC 200 due to a USADA testing violation. As a result, John was suspended for one year by both USADA and the Nevada Athletic Commission. Because John was forced off of UFC 200 just three days before the event, the options for a short notice replacement were slim. On less than two days notice, the former middleweight champion Anderson Silva, who was only a few months removed from gallbladder removal surgery, mind you, stepped in against Cormier. The fight was reduced to three rounds though, and moved down to the third fight on the pay-per-view, while Amanda Nunes versus Misha Tate became the new headliner. This was only one of several changes to the card that was initially supposed to feature a rematch between Conor McGregor and Nate Diaz, as well as Jones vs. Cormier too. The fight between Cormier and Silva was certainly a fight that happened. Cormier largely held Silva down en route to a 30-26 decision on all three judges' scorecards. DC had some good ground and pound in the first round and sporadically through the second and third, but large swaths of the fight were spent with Cormier laying in half guard and Silva simply trying to stall his offense. DC racked up over 10 minutes of control time, but it probably would have been close to a 13 or 14 if Big John McCarthy hadn't given Silva two of the biggest gift stand-ups I've ever seen in the sport, probably as a response to the frequent booing from the crowd. After the fight, fans seemed to come away with the opinion that DC was scared of standing with Silva, so he chose to lay and prey on him. After re-watching the fight, I don't think that was true. Anderson certainly had moments of success, most notably late in the third round, when he landed a left body kick that badly hurt DC. That being said, Daniel landed as many strikes on the feet as Anderson did. He was more than willing to swing and bang in the pocket with Silva as well, and actually landed some very hard shots. He just didn't play around with Silva in kickboxing. I know people didn't want to see DC wrestle a legend like Anderson, but really, what would you expect him to do? Anderson is one of the most dangerous strikers in UFC history. Even at 41, he was a threat, which DC learned in the third. Why would Cormier willingly put himself into Silva's area of expertise when he didn't have to? That would be a pretty idiotic move, and for all the things you can say about DC, he's not an idiot. Normally, I wouldn't go on at length about an issue like this, considering it's not a Daniel Cormier documentary per se but John Jones was one of the people pushing the narrative that DC was afraid of Silva. He went so far as to say that Anderson called him and said that he felt fear coming off of Daniel during their fight. Regardless of how you feel about DC's approach to the fight, he got the victory over Silva. With John out for another year, Daniel would need to defend the title again though. Cormier was booked in a rematch against Anthony Rumble Johnson at UFC 206 in December of 2016. Since his submission loss to DC at UFC 187, Rumble had brutally knocked out Jimmy Manoa, Ryan Bader, and Glover Tejera, setting up the rematch with Cormier. Unfortunately, DC was forced off the card due to an injury, and the rematch was rebooked for UFC 210 in April of 2017. This matchup is perhaps more well known for the pre-fight shenanigans, which have come to be known as Towelgate, than the fight itself. Cormier failed his first weigh-in attempt, coming in 1.2 pounds over the championship limit of 205 pounds. On his second attempt, Cormier held onto the towel and visibly pushed against it. And now Daniel Cormier is back and made weight. How did that happen? This incident was controversial for a number of reasons, but ultimately citing a nebulous, unofficial commission policy that allowed fighters to weigh in a second time after a failed attempt, the New York State Athletic Commission decided not to punish Cormier. Now, you know John Jones wasn't going to miss an opportunity to take a shot at Cormier for Towelgate. During a media scrum for UFC 210, John referred to the towel incident as one of the dirtiest things I've seen in sports. It's a, um, what a clever trick, pretty dishonest of him. I would imagine there has to be some type of commission or something to, to go back and, and see this blatant foul play and address it, uh, address it. No one's addressed it, they just completely got away with doing one of the dirtiest things I've seen in sports, so. And considering all of the dirty things John has seen from a first-person perspective, that's really saying something. Cormier would initially deny that he held onto the towel to beat the scales, saying that there was some issue with the scales that gave him an incorrect reading. However, years later during the speech for his induction into the UFC Hall of Fame, DC confessed that he had in fact held onto the towel. According to DC, he couldn't lose any more weight and this was an old wrestling trick. Either way, there were no repercussions for DC's actions. Though the New York Commission would later amend their way in procedures to say that a fighter shall not make physical contact with any person or object other than the scale. When DC and Rumble eventually fought, there was no controversy. It was a somewhat strange fight though. Other than a flurry of strikes where a kick broke DC's nose, Rumble predominantly tried to take Cormier down. 
Even though he succeeded on more than one occasion, this was an odd game plan. Daniel is the superior wrestler, and Johnson had shown below average endurance throughout his career. Eventually, Rumble's gas tank failed, and DC got a takedown of his own. From this point, the result was a foregone conclusion. Cormier softened Johnson up with some ground and pound before locking in the rear naked choke and getting the tap. In his post-fight speech, Cormier verbally sparred with Jimmy Manoa, who was cage side, before turning his attention to John Jones, who was also in attendance. Don't talk to me about a guy that's ineligible. When you get your shit together and you're ready to fight, I'm here waiting for you, young man. You know it. With the fight between DC and Rumble in the books, the way was finally paved for the much-anticipated rematch between Jones and Cormier. Once the fight was officially booked, they immediately went back to beefing on social media like nothing ever happened. It was fairly lighthearted to start. On May 30th, John responded to one of Daniel's replies to a now-deleted tweet from a fan, saying, Man, I can't wait to pop you in the mouth. DC fired back by saying it was funny that John would choose the word pop, like pop positive, pop a molly, pop a Cialis. He could go on for days. Which John acknowledged was a decent joke, adding, LOL, let's not forget me popping your cherry. It didn't take very long for the feud between DC and John to become more serious. Before the curtain could even be lifted on the UFC's summer kickoff press conference, they were already engaged in an altercation. After John made comments in reference to Cormier's kids, DC threw a water bottle at him and had to be restrained. The tension carried over to the press conference, which I would argue is one of the better pressers the UFC has ever put on. One of John's main talking points was that DC was not a real champion because Cormier did not beat him to win the belt. So the belt that he has over there, it's an imaginary belt. I messed up outside of the octagon. I got that taken away from me. But the guy's never beaten me. In order to be the champion, you have to beat the champion which DC responded to by repeatedly calling John a bitch. He's a bitch! He's a bitch ass! I that had you crying. Hey. John fired back by bringing up Daniel crying on Kane's shoulder after their first fight, which prompted DC to go full Mike Perry on him, much to John's chagrin. Yeah, you threw bitch a water bomb. Nigga. Yeah, you threw a water bomb. Yeah. You know what you are. Now you're calling me yeah. a bitch bomb? Tell you what Real cool. He's it's the most John Jones way to react to something, outside of doing a bump and cranking the steering wheel into a mother-to-be, of course. As the presser progressed, Cormier was questioned by Ariel Helwani about his general demeanor. Daniel explained that although he sees John at the press conference, he was still concerned about whether or not John would make it to the fight, or if he would somehow mess up again. Is this guy really going to go to the fight? Is this guy going to mess this up again by doing steroids or snorting cocaine or sandblasting prostitutes? What's this guy going to do? What's this guy gonna do to mess this up this time? This led John to return fire with one of the most iconic lines from this entire feud. I beat you after a weekend of cocaine. And prostitutes. <laughs> back to back weekends. Cocaine one, your ass the next. In a similar vein, when John complained about DC being called the champ, DC referred to John as a guy that doesn't even fight anymore. Who are you to say who's a champion? You're some guy that doesn't even fight. You're damn near retired, son. You're barely coming back. Shut your ass up. As far as UFC press conferences go, this one ranks among the best. And it's due in large part to the feud between Jones and DC. Cormier's willingness to attack John based on his many transgressions was a refreshing departure from DC's usually professional demeanor. And if I am being honest, John probably asked for it by bringing up DC's family backstage. Also, listening to a man like Daniel Cormier explaining sandblasting, which was explained to him by Luke Rockhold, obviously, was pretty amusing. I guess it means you take the cocaine, put it on the prostitute, snort it, then blow your face in it and it makes like a snow, a, a cocaine cloud, like a cloud of cocaine just in the room while the prostitute's laying on her back. This is what Rocco told me it is. The trash talk between John and DC did simmer down for a few weeks, but as we've seen from the four other times they tried to book these two, the trash talk wouldn't stop when the press conference ended. It would continue until they set foot in the cage. On June 6th, Alexander Gustafson appeared on the MMA Hour, and one of the questions he was asked by Ariel Helwani was if he believed that John had been using PEDs during their fight. Um, you mentioned USADA. Do you, do you think he has used PEDs? Gustafson averred that he did. I, I believe so. I believe so. I think he's been doing a lot of stuff mm. that he shouldn't be doing, so... The following day, Daniel Cormier spoke on Fox Sports 1 and revealed his own theory for John's UFC 200 USADA violation. Quote, I think he fought Owen St. Preux clean, and he didn't like the way he felt, and tried to do something again dirty, and he got caught at UFC 200. I think he will still be very tough, because he has a ton of skill. He's very quick. He's very long. 
he's got a lot of physical advantages that a lot of us don't have. I think what you will see is he will be a little more tentative. He may not be as aggressive in some places. I think you'll see a guy in the beginning of his career where he actually started to tire. He got tired just beating on Stefan Bonner." End quote. It goes without saying that John saw this and had to respond. He delivered a two-tweet salvo in Cormier's direction. Quote, Imagine having so much power over a man that he thinks your abilities are supernatural. The difference between you and I, I've punished the motherfuckers I thought were on steroids. You protect your pride with lies. End quote. Cormier then responded by saying, You are right, you punish cheaters. You took no pity on yourself, did you? You constantly punish yourself, lol. I punish you next. I'll give you a break, lol. Aside from this brief engagement, the rest of June was fairly quiet. Sadly, on the 13th, it was reported that John's mother, Camille, had passed away from her long battle with diabetes. Cormier paid his respects on Twitter, saying, In our community, the mother is the backbone. At Johnny Bones, Arthur, Chandler, and Mr. Jones, I'm sorry for your loss. R.I.P. Miss Camille. Prayers. End quote. As bitter as the relationship between Cormier and John may have been at times, there were moments like this, or when Cormier's own parents passed away, where they could find a little civility and kindness towards each other. It's one of the aspects of their feud that stands out among the landscape of MMA. It was dark, grungy, and quite personal at times. But both men still showed some humanity on occasion. For a little while, at least. On the 4th of July, DC was simply celebrating Independence Day by mentioning how lucky he felt to represent America in the Olympics. Of course, John had to come in and rain on that parade by bringing up Cormier's weight-cutting issues that kept him out of the 2008 Olympics. I know I just mentioned how these two were capable of finding the odd moments of grace and tact, but this is the flip side. An absolutely petty and frankly unnecessary jab at a man just trying to celebrate the 4th of July. This now familiar social media sniping continued as the fight neared. On the 16th, Daniel made an Instagram post saying that this was the best his wrestling had felt in a long time, and he planned to dump John in his doped up head. This logically incensed John, who left half a dozen responses to DC's post. Quote, Reading all the comments, you would swear this was my page. Don't worry, Daniel's laying on people and dry humping days will be over soon. Hashtag and never were. Next time someone's taking pictures, put your shirt on. Your boy making you look like a pipsqueak, lol. Just make sure you don't get yourself choked out in the process of showing off these rejuvenated takedowns of yours. Tell your cameraman you did a great job hiding that belly. Gus set you down like three times and he's a boxer. Anthony Johnson took you down like three times and we all know that guy's not wrestling every day. Admit it, you are not the wrestler you used to be. The person who missed weight while representing our country at the Olympics. You are a much lesser version of that guy. One that I'm not afraid of at all. So now the reason why you couldn't take me down the first time and I ended up taking you down like four times is because you weren't working out with this dude? LOL. End quote. It didn't end there though. DC responded to John on Instagram by calling him obsessed and saying he had a limp dick. <laughs> this is where the banter migrated to Twitter. DC posted a screenshot of his Instagram post to Twitter with the caption, Johnny boy is going down. He's stalking me. And they say I'm obsessed. Stay your insecure ass off my social media. Your whipping is coming. Hashtag and still. A few hours later, John got around to making his reply. Quote, So I have a limp dick? When's the last time you spoke with the missus? What grown man comments on another man's dick anyways? Middle finger emoji. I have zero respect for you, bitch. You're going to really hate me by the time I'm done with you. And this asshole has the nerve to comment on my leg genetics? Has he looked in the mirror? See his fucked up hairline? Dude couldn't get a six pack if his life depended on it. Definitely don't mention genetics, pussy. End quote. This wasn't quite the end of it either. On the 19th, John took another shot at DC by posting a picture of himself mocking Cormier's infamous towel pofa. Quote, all the discipline and hard work is definitely paying off. Was a mean 217 pounds today after practice. Hashtag no shortcuts to greatness. Hashtag cheating asshole. End quote. The animosity between John and DC carried over to the media obligations leading up to the event. But by this point, both men seemed fatigued with the petty bickering. It's understandable why. This fight was 938 days in the making. This was the fifth time that two had gone through the process of trying to hype up the fight and the third time they had been this deep into the process. As John said during an interview with BT Sport, I mean, It's just so pointless at this point. It's like, oh, you know, you're, you're a punk. Oh, you suck. Oh, no, you suck. You it's know, been you done. Suck. Yeah, you know what I mean? We're both adult men. Yeah. DC similarly tired of talking about John and simply wanted to get to the fight itself. You know, at this point, I'm, I, at this point, I'm really, really not interested in, in arguing and fighting with this guy anymore. 
I'm not interested in, in the back and forth. I'm not interested in all that stuff anymore. He had said for a long time that he believed that bringing his emotions into the octagon was what caused him to lose their first fight, and he was not going to let his hatred of John overwhelm him again. Last time, I, I thought I brought a lot of that into the octagon with me. It served me no good. I mean, and mentally, I feel better than I've ever felt. So I won't take any of this animosity into the fight. That doesn't mean there wasn't any back and forth between the two foes. One of the central points of friction between John and DC was the steroid issue. During the conference call for UFC 214, John said that he was happy to be fighting under USADA testing because it would give his opponents no excuses when he won. I'm so excited because of Saturday, USADA is still fully intact. And I'm going to do exactly what I did last time, but I feel like it's going to be in a better fashion. And there will be no excuse, no excuse for, for me winning, but my hard work, my heart, my faith, and my belief. I get to put uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the uh, critics to rest. Oh, like, oh, well, he did it again. Definitely wasn't steroids this time, so I'm just interested to hear what people have to say after Saturday. Later on in the conference call, John aired out his frustration with DC accusing him of using steroids in what was a fairly atypical loss of composure, at least during a public media appearance. Now he's trying to freaking convince the world that I did steroids. That, that, that actually gets to me a little bit because... I think deep down, this motherfucker knows that I wouldn't do steroids. Come on now. He knows in his heart that I didn't do steroids. But anyways. <sighs> anyways. The right, uh, I feel like I answered your question. I, this, this whole thing has become a tag of John Jones' character. I feel like when Daniel loses, he'll be able to say, well, I'm a fucking good guy. I'm a good guy, and, and at least people will respect me for being a good champion when I had that belt in John's absence. And, and, and I think that he deserves respect because he is a good guy. But you don't got to fucking try to convince the world that I did steroids, bro, to fucking just fucking say, look yourself in the mirror and say, God damn it, he's younger than me, he's athletic, and he beat my ass. DC, however, would maintain his previous position that he believed John had been using PEDs for most of his career. Do you truly believe that when he fought you the first time he was on steroids? I do. You do? Well, the other day, uh, John about cried on the press conference because I had accused him of using steroids. But if I do feel he did try to cheat, yeah, I do. Then I will say it. And yes, I do believe he's done it for a long time. While John's defense of lifting his shirt to show his abs was convincing, his retort that DC looked like a crackhead with a suit on was a bit ill-conceived. I could look like a crackhead with a suit on, but I've never been a crackhead like you, though. <laughs> yeah, you kind of softballed that one at him, John. John would later resort to splitting hairs about whether or not USADA technically used the word steroids when adjudicating his UFC 200 violation. I cried too when you got popped with steroids. steroids, young man. Did USADA ever say you, the word steroids? Hey, listen. I think one of the most interesting moments came during the aforementioned conference call when John said he tainted his legacy with estrogen blockers. The UFC uh, 200 situation happened, and um, and I and I tainted my legacy because uh, because of an estrogen blocker. He tainted it. For a guy like John, who is such a proficient deflector and euphemizer, this is a very interesting slip up. Aside from a bit more bickering about each other, crying, and the issue of Anderson Silva saying that DC was afraid of him, the two generally talked about themselves and what this fight would mean for them. In a similar fashion to his return post-car crash, John spoke about how excited he was to be back and how much he wanted to remind fans of how exciting he was as a fighter. I've, I've, uh, I've forgiven myself for, for the things that's happened, and, and, I, and I feel like I've done the right thing to get my life back together. It's chasing an idea that an average kid like me from inner city in Rochester could grow up to be someone who's remembered forever. My intentions uh, is just to... Uh, Remind the fans of, of, you know, why I'm a fan favorite in the first place, you know. Get the fans excited again, like really excited right now. I feel like the UFC is lacking some stars. He also reinforced the previous narrative that much of his downfall was the result of becoming a millionaire at 23 years old and then taking his brand and success for granted. I got thrown into, uh, became a multimillionaire when I was 23 years old. And that can do, to, uh, that can do a lot to someone who's never prepared for that type of lifestyle getting thrusted into the limelight and, and millions of dollars in fame at age 23, and, you know, you can lose yourself if, if you aren't prepared for it. And, uh, you know, I think, I think my talent and, and, and my brand 
it grew faster than my character and, and me as a person. And what I've concluded was um, I didn't take anything uh, seriously. While that may be true, it's also a fact that the amount of money John made so early in his career probably afforded him opportunities that many other fighters did not have. Think of how many fighters have to work sometimes full-time jobs just to pay for their MMA careers. I mean, Pantoja was doing Uber Eats while being a ranked flyweight. There is no way that somebody in that position can train as hard or as often as somebody like John, who was very comfortable financially. Especially when, as you hear it from John, he was training four times a day in the lead up to UFC 214. Physically, there's not much you can do in one week, but the things that he got to see, I mean, to watch his older brother train four, day, four times a day, you know, I, I train four times a day. I'm not sure if that's common or not. I, I think it's a lot. So when I do that fourth workout every day, I know for a, I know for a fact that this injury-prone guy over here is probably not training four times a day. Does that sound a little dubious? Well, let's put a pin in that for now. For Cormier, the questions seem to center on his age and legacy. DC admitted that he was feeling older and it was beginning to get harder for him to train. It feels long in the beginning. Like, I'm like, man, you wake up and the knees are a little more creaky, you know, and the back hurts a little bit more in the morning. And I'm like, geez, how do I get this done? And Something John Jones also honed in on. Um, I know for a fact that a 39-year-old that a cannot possibly keep up with a 29-year-old a um, when it comes to training your ass off every day. While Daniel denied that he was having any trouble with his weight cut, it's difficult to look at him during the UFC 214 pre-fight press conference or the open workout and not see he looked like he was struggling. His face was noticeably drawn out, and there was an uncharacteristic caginess to his demeanor. This probably wasn't helped by the California Athletic Commission's newly implemented regulations intended to prevent extreme weight cutting, meaning that DC would not be allowed to weigh more than 225 pounds on fight night. The main question was what this fight meant for Daniel's legacy. He acknowledged that this fight was important for cementing his legacy. But the reality is, for me, I do need to win this fight. If you look at all the things that I've done in my career, uh, I've done it all outside of beating John Jones. He said that the fight with John outweighed every other moment in his career as an athlete. The most important thing for his legacy was to get that loss back. Uh, they offered me the Manuel fight for July 29th in Anaheim. And I told the boss, it needs to be Jones. You know, I go, it needs to be Jones. I go, make it happen. What it boils down to for me is competitively, I need to get this loss back. That's been what's been driving me for the last two and a half years. It bears mentioning that much of the production and promotion for this fight centered around John's return or redemption. During the lead up to UFC 214, DC stated his desire to be the one that denied John his redemption, because John's redemption was the fact that he got to compete at all, not win. But the redemption is the fact that he gets to go back and compete. The redemption isn't the championship anymore. He gets another opportunity to be a good citizen, to be a good competitor, and just a good human being in general. You take from that, you learn from that, learn from all those mistakes, and do that. After ruminating on this feud for as long as I have, I think I figured out what made it so entertaining, so compelling. Neither man is perfect. John obviously has much greater flaws and insecurities than Daniel, but they both have them and both men have a surprising aptitude for pouring salt in the wounds of the other man. Like a good fight, trash talk is the most entertaining when it's back and forth. Despite DC having endless ammunition in the form of steroid accusations, coke, prostitutes, dick pills, and car crashes, John was frequently able to land a surgical strike with some deeply cutting and insightful remark about Cormier. Why would I hate you? I beat you already. What do I have to, I have nothing to prove to you. You just so happen to be the person who's holding on to my championship. Daddy's home to pick it up. This dynamic made every interaction between DC and John highly entertaining. But there comes a point when the talking eventually has to end, and the fighters have to settle their disagreements in the cage. Jones versus Cormier is an odd fight, for a number of reasons that we will be getting to. Early on, it was actually reminiscent of their first meeting, with the first two rounds being fairly close. Round one of this fight is arguably the closest round we've seen from these two. Only a difference of three significant strikes separated them. Both fighters came out swinging with bad intentions, and within the first 15 seconds, DC went for a takedown attempt off of a front kick from John. Then during a brief clinch exchange, DC landed a hard uppercut that actually knocked John's mouthpiece out. Mouthpiece or not, John didn't stop coming forward. After Jones landed multiple kicks, Big John McCarthy paused the action to give Jones his mouthpiece back. Only moments later, John would score a takedown on DC, but Cormier almost immediately got back to his feet. 
John began picking away at Cormier with what Luke Thomas would describe as single shot high variance strikes. Um, I don't really like you, Luke, so I'm not going to answer your question. He was throwing a variety of kicks from both stances and targeting DC's legs and midsection. While keeping Cormier at range with kicks, John would mix in a few jabs, overhand rights, and digging hooks to the body. That said, DC was surprisingly able to have success with kicks of his own. These were not distance managing kicks either. They were hard leg kicks. Cormier was also doing some subtle body work, as well as using the so-called mummy guard to briefly occupy the 12-inch reach advantage of Jones, before leaping in with power punches. A few of these shots seemingly hurt John enough that he clinched up with Cormier to avoid any follow-ups, but a few seconds later DC caught him anyway. By the end of the round, Cormier was throwing punches and kicks in combinations while trash-talking Jones. For however briefly, the momentum had shifted in DC's favor. Round 2 went fairly similar to round 1. John circled and tried to pot shot Daniel with a variety of rangy strikes. Meanwhile, DC pressed forward, trying to close the distance with wide looping shots and mixing in a few hard leg kicks as well. As the round progressed, they worked in the clinch a little. DC found a slight edge by landing some body shots and almost succeeded in taking John down. Although momentum briefly sent DC ass over tea kettle, John wasn't able to capitalize, and when they clinched up again, Cormier ripped him to the body some more. That being said, DC was beginning to chase John a bit, and his blitzes were not finding the mark as frequently. The difference in significant strikes was not profound, but Jones had widened the gap. Round 3 appeared to be more of the same, with the addition of John working in some almost proto-calf kicks to his repertoire. DC was still working the mummy guard with mixed success. He managed to find a home for his bread and butter right uppercut left hook combo, but he was now predominantly stalking forward and looking for an opportunity to land a big punch. But the blitzes were coming less often, and some of his big swings resulted in big misses. More importantly, John was going to the body frequently. These body shots and low kicks hadn't just been chipping away at Daniel's stamina, they had been conditioning Cormier to expect strikes on the left side to come low. When John threw a kick at 2 minutes and 38 seconds, DC put his hands down to block, but John was going high. This was a weakness Cormier had shown for years, and was even highlighted by John during the awkward press conference where he threatened to be intimate and passionate with DC. You're talking about the Josh Burnett fight, but... Oh. <laughs> you see, so maybe we are on the same that, wavelength. Oh. That will be figured out by September 27th, okay. so don't think you're going to kick me in the head with your left leg. Yeah, that didn't age well, Daniel. To the credit of Cormier's chin, he wasn't even knocked down by a flush head kick, but he was badly hurt. John swarmed on him immediately, and while trying to get out of the way of a flying knee, Cormier fell to the mat. John pounced on him and began raining down some of the most violent ground and pound we've ever seen in this sport. It was like he was throwing every ounce of hatred and malice into these shots. No matter how good your chin is, you can't take these kind of punches undefended. After letting a seemingly unconscious Cormier take enough unnecessary punches to the back of the head to ensure that he'd always forget the names of half of the fighters on every card he called in the future, Big John McCarthy finally stopped the fight at 301 of round 3. When the result was read, a very emotional Jones fell to his knees and gave, all things considered, a heartfelt speech about being able to get his belt back after letting so many people down. It's never over. As long as you never quit, it's never over. I'm back here. Proving humble in victory, John would also praise Cormier for being a model champion, as well as someone he aspired to be like. I want to take this time to thank Daniel Cormier. He has been a model champion, a model husband, a model, a model father. He is a true champion for the rest of his life. For some reason, Joe decided to interview DC, who was visibly upset and still recovering from being knocked out. In this tragic and bizarre interview, DC echoed a sentiment he had made leading up to the fight. As I've said time and time again, this rivalry is a rivalry when I win the fight this weekend. If you don't win the fight, it's no rivalry. If you win both fights, there is no rivalry, so I, I don't know. This was a bittersweet moment. If you were a fan of Cormier, you would have to be gutted to see him lose in the way he did. But at the same time, it was undeniable that Jones was the better fighter. Whatever you may have thought of him at the time, his comeback after the last two years was inspiring. He proved that even somebody who fucked up as bad, and as often as he had, could find redemption. <sighs> then he failed another drug test. Chapter 14. Positively Unbelievable On August 22nd, TMZ reported that Jones had tested positive for the steroid oral terinabol. 
Following the story, Brett Okamoto of ESPN got confirmation from Dana White that the story was true, but that John had not yet been stripped of the title. This news was also confirmed by Andy Foster, executive officer of the California State Athletic Commission, in a statement provided to MMAfighting.com. The UFC followed suit later that evening and released an official statement saying they had been notified by USADA that John Jones had been informed of a potential anti-doping policy violation stemming from an in-competition sample collected following his weigh-in on July 28, 2017. In a statement to MMAfighting.com, John's manager, Malki Kawa, confirmed the news as well. Quote, We are all at a complete loss for words right now. John, his trainers, his nutritionists, and his entire camp have worked tirelessly and meticulously the past 12 months to avoid this exact situation. We are having the samples tested again to determine the validity or source of contamination. John is crushed by this news, and we are doing everything we can as a team to support him." End quote. The following day, John's manager appeared on the MMA Hour to discuss the test results and revealed that the substance John tested positive for was Turinabol. TMZ came out and, and, and put out what the substance was, Turinabol. Can you confirm that? Is that it? That's from what I understand it is Turinabol. Okay. However, he also stated his belief that the test result must have been due to a tainted supplement. Something here doesn't fit. It's not sitting right. I'm assuming it's the supplements he took. Um, we just obviously got to get to work on it to see, you know, what what was taken that month, that those three week period, that week of the fight, to figure it out from there. Once again, after Kawa made the information public, USADA released a statement of their own, confirming that John had indeed tested positive for Turinabol. Chlorodihydromethyltestosterone, better known as oral Turinabol, is an anabolic steroid that was invented in the 1960s in East Germany. For several decades, it was a key part of East Germany's secret doping program, and was administered to thousands of athletes up until the GDR's collapse in 1989. However, production of Turinabol for medical use ended in the mid-90s. For my limited understanding of PEDs, Turinabol is not a particularly commonly used anabolic, as there are just better options like D-Ball, which T-Ball is a derivative of. It does have some benefits, like the fact that as far as these compounds go, it doesn't lead to a lot of weight gain or water retention, which of course would be pretty useful for somebody who has to cut weight. That said, Turinabol is generally used as part of a stack, alongside other PEDs and potentially masking agents. When this news broke, Chael Sonnen came out and confirmed this by saying that if they caught John for T-Ball, they must have missed the really good stuff he was taking. In the same interview, Chael also stated his opinion that John had been using PEDs during their fight at UFC 159. All I can tell you is I had a higher juice concentrate than Tropicana, and he pushed me around like a Mack truck versus a Volvo. So uh, I think for the better part of his career, you know, that, that seems to be how it works. On August 27th, John officially broke his silence on Twitter, saying, Times like these remind me how blessed I truly am. So much to be grateful for. As the days went by, there was a great deal of speculation about the meaning of John's test results. We learned that John had passed the tests that were administered on July 6th and 7th, then failed the test administered after the weigh-ins on the 28th. The situation only became more confusing when it was revealed that John had passed his post-fight drug test after UFC 214. Even Andy Foster of the California State Athletic Commission was confused about the circumstances. Quote, At that point, one of two things is probably going on here. He's either extremely careless or he's a cheater. I know he's already been extremely careless once in his career, but none of this makes any sense. That's why I think it's important that we vet this and look at all the available evidence before we jump to conclusions and hang this guy out to dry. End quote. However, a USADA spokesperson later released a statement to MMA Fighting's Ariel Helwani, saying that Jones provided a urine and blood sample on July 6th and an additional urine sample on the 7th, all of which were reported negative. On July 28th, his urine sample tested positive for Turinabol, as confirmed previously, and then after the fight he provided a blood sample that was reported negative." End quote. Importantly, they also clarify that Turinabol is only tested for in urine screens, and not in blood tests. So while it may at first seem a bit strange that John pissed Todd at the weigh-ins and then passed a test on the night of the fight, we now know that he wasn't tested for Turinabol after the fight, making it seem a lot less inexplicable. Regardless of the peculiarities of the test results, when John's B sample was tested, it was also positive for Turinabol. Consequently, on September 13th, the CSAC overturned John's win over Daniel Cormier. The fight was ruled a no contest. Following the CSAC's decision, the UFC stripped John of the title for the third time and Cormier was reinstated as a light heavyweight champ. Now, Daniel could have kicked John while he was down. He was more than entitled to that. 
Honestly, after everything John had put him through, DC was entitled to fucking river dance on John's ribs. But Cormier took the high road instead, asking fans to lay off of John and show him some compassion, if only for the sake of his family at least. In the following months, we didn't hear a lot about John. We learned that USADA was still testing him, and he passed a test administered on October 11th. Opinions on John were a mixed bag at the time. For instance, you had people like Michael Bisbing saying John should be banned for life. Dana White was saying he was an unfixable party animal, and possibly the biggest waste of talent in sports history. This wasn't just Dana shitting on John either. There was a real possibility that John had seriously screwed his career up. Because this was John's second USADA violation, he was facing a suspension of up to four years, in the middle of his prime. Even Joe Rogan called him a fuck-up. On the other hand, Joe did spread a bizarre conspiracy theory that John's USADA violation could have been due to coke cut with Chinese creatine that was contaminated with Terinobol, so make of that what you will. In November, John was given a continuance by the California State Athletic Commission, and eventually the date of his hearing was set for February 27th of 2018. This hearing is nearly three hours long, and it's filled with a lot of minutia and repetition, so I'm not going to go over it with a fine-tooth comb. Instead, I'm only going to discuss the most relevant details brought up during the hearing. The arguments put forth both by Andy Foster of the CSAC, as well as John's defense, focused on the long-term M3 metabolite of oral terinobol, which was present in John's urine sample taken on the day of the weigh-ins, July 28th. The substance in question is terinobol, an M3 marker that's a metabolite. Both the expert witness for the CSAC, as well as John's defense, agreed on a great deal regarding this M3 metabolite. Both agree that because terinobol is illegal in the U.S., there haven't been enough studies done to say much about it with certainty. They also agree that the lack of quantitative testing done on John's samples made it difficult to extrapolate much from the evidence available. As his expert witness, Executive Officer Foster, called up Daniel Eichner. Eichner is the president of the Sports Medicine Research and Testing Laboratory, or SMIRTLE, in Utah. During his testimony, Eichner came across as a very impartial witness. He stated that after reviewing the test results, he believed that oral terinobol had been administered somewhere after John's July 7th test that he passed. Oral terinobol was administered sometime after his July 7th test when we tested it later in July. When asked if he could draw any conclusions based on the fact that John tested negative on July 7th, positive for oral terinobol on the 27th, and then negative again in October, he said that he could not. Well, why is that? Well for a couple of reasons. There's, there needs to be further research conducted to look at the metabolism and excretion rate of old terenobol and some of the necessary studies that could help shed light on, on how long it's detected for after administration haven't been done. Nor could he come to any conclusions about the dosages suggested by Dr. Scott in his report because of the lack of evidence. This was generally Eichner's position when asked to speculate on any further hypotheticals, like dosages administered, time frames, and windows of detection. Can you say whether the um, metabolite M3 uh, was ingested for therapeutic reasons or was ingested by accident? There's not enough information available to make a determination, no. Do you agree with uh, Mr. Scott's report on his conclusions and his conclusions as to whether it was therapeutic or contaminated? There's not enough information to make the determination. I don't know. John's expert witness was a bit of a different story. Dr. Scott agreed with Dr. Eichner's opinions that studies on long-term metabolites of terinobol are lacking. He also agreed that the conclusion he came to in his report was the result of several assumptions. Um, I want to be clear, the ultimate conclusion in my report that this was most likely from a contaminated supplement does depend on the assumptions that are made. To summarize Dr. Scott's testimony, he was of the opinion that the July 28th violation for the M3 metabolite was the result of a contaminated substance, not intentional administration of oral terinobol, because someone intentionally using terinobol would be using it regularly and in large quantities. If that were the case, terinobol itself would have shown up in the July 28th test. Um, because if it happened very close to the 28th, you would see the parent. Uh, we don't see the parent. Um, we only see the M3, so when you say the parent, uh, oral terinobol, you would see the DHCMT, the actual drug. The actual drug. Or the long-term metabolites would have shown up in the October 11th test. What we can say definitively is that if it were a contamination level, it would possibly be in, in the July 28th test when we see it there. 
Um, and it would certainly, unless that substance that was contaminated was continually administered, um, it would not be uh, in the October uh, 11 test, which is again something we see. So. That being said, there were some issues with this argument that came out during the questioning process. One was the fact that Dr. Scott had not figured out what a Turinabal regimen for John Jones would have looked like, and he was speculating based on a protocol John's attorney took from a bodybuilding website. Um, I think it's reasonable to assume that I could have, with a Google search, have figured this out at some point. Um, the time constraints for this report were something along the lines of, what, four hours? Um, those were taken from a reference on a bodybuilding website, I believe, uh, that was provided to me by Mr. Jacobs as part of my assumptions. Another issue was that the time frame between the positive test on July 28th and the negative test on October 11th was actually 75 days, which would be beyond the 40 to 50 day detection window mentioned in the study done on turinabal metabolites cited by Dr. Scott. You, uh, you identify a 51 day detection window for turinabal, is that true? Yes, uh, approximately, and that comes, uh, that detection window comes from Solvodesky. Can you tell me the time between July 28th and October 11th in days? Uh, not precisely, but it's 60 some days or maybe 70 days. If I told you it was 75, would you disagree? No. Now, would 75 days be outside the 51 day window detection? Yes. Furthermore, when questioned if there was a middle ground between the dichotomy of the result being either a contaminated product or an intentional daily administration, Scott confirmed that there were a lot of possibilities. It could, it could be a lot of other things as well. A lot of other things? Probably not, but, but the things that you're describing make, make are reasonable. In someone other words, could have taken it once? Yes, someone could have taken it once, that's or right. twice? Yes. Or three times? That's right. Or every other day? That's right. Okay. So a lot of other things. Okay. Additionally, it should be said that despite Dr. Scott's opinion being that the positive test was the result of a contaminated substance, he admitted that none of the products, including 15 supplements and two massage creams tested by his lab or the Smyrtle lab, were shown to contain any traces of turinabol or turinabol metabolites. There were a number of supplements that were tested in my laboratory for the presence of um, the parent compound, uh, oral turinabol, uh, and we were not able to confirm the presence uh, in any of those substances. I think this is important to mention, because over the years, John has repeatedly tried to spin his multiple drug test failures by saying that it was scientifically proven that he did not intentionally take steroids. But the truth is that no such thing ever happened. It was never proven that he took a tainted supplement. All we know is that he had trace amounts of a trinobol metabolite in his system. This is where we come to John's testimony. After saying that he did not knowingly take turinabol, and talking about his immediate reaction to the news of the USADA violation, John began to talk about the supplements he was taking in the lead-up to UFC 214. According to John, all of the supplements he took were chosen by his nutritionist to be third-party certified. While one of his managers, Ibrahim Kawa, worked closely with USADA to make sure everything he took was USADA compliant. As well. Yes, I work with a nutritionist who is uh, my jiu-jitsu coach's wife. Her name is Michelle. Michelle and Abraham were, were working really closely to make sure there was nothing uh, that could put me in that situation that I found myself in a while back with, you know, the, with the uh, male enhancement stuff. He attributed this enhanced caution to the lesson he learned from the dick pill incident. For some reason, on July 8th, John's nutritionist changed John's supplement regime. But again, according to John, they made sure everything was USADA approved and third-party certified. So we ended up scratching these things that, that were darn near organic um, to go for things that were strictly okay with you, Sana. When questioned about what he had done to ascertain the source of the contamination, he said they had all of his supplements tested. But it got to the point where the only thing he could think of were conspiracy theories about somebody slipping something into his food or drinks. Um, which can drive a person crazy trying to think of that type of stuff. More broadly, John addressed some of the concerns about his past actions, like his hit and run, and whether they demonstrate a pattern of reckless behavior. To be honest, it's sort of the standard John Jones response of saying that he made a lot of dumb decisions in his 20s, but now he's trying to better himself and become a role model. It's been, it's been a process, um, but I feel like I've, I've definitely been putting forth so much effort to make things better and better because I understand that my, my life is an example to other people. He was adamant that he wasn't a cheater, though. You know, you can call me many things. You can call me a little bit of a party boy or a little bit of a wild guy or a knucklehead, but a cheater is something that I'll never, ever admit to. 
Whether it's fair or not, the majority of the commission's questions focused on John's past actions. In particular, Commissioner Martha Schenner Quidez grilled John on the fact that he did not declare the dick pill on his declaration of use form before UFC 200, where he tested positive for two estrogen blockers. So at the time that you were tested, you also filled out the standard declaration of use form. On that occasion, when you filled that out, you actually didn't write, you wrote down that you haven't taken any supplements, correct? Yes. But actually, you had. You just didn't put them in. Yes. And it was the Tadalafil, and also there was a tea animal, something like that, another supplement that you take, but you didn't put them in. Further, Shenner Kidez pointed out that prior to UFC 214, John declared eight supplements, but after he popped for Terinobol, an additional ten supplements were sent to the Smyrtle lab for testing. Continuing down this line of logic, the commissioner brought up John's 2015 drag racing incident, for which he was given five citations and later arrested. While you were on probation, you were actually cited like five times, including for drag racing, were you not? Yep, it was all. John tried to dismiss this issue by saying that he had been given all five of the bogus citations as a result of revving his engine at a stoplight. The commissioner replied by pointing out that the reason John was arrested was because he violated his probation by not declaring the citations to his probation officer. But you did not report that as you were supposed to, and then you were arrested for a violation of your probation. No, ma'am. The defendant is agreeing to, is admitting to violating the amended paragraph 2, which is failure to report police contacts in a timely manner. Additionally, Shenner Kidez brought up the fact that when John initially joined the USADA testing pool, he was required to take online educational tutorials. So you became part of the registered testing pool for USADA? Yes. And as part of this RTP, you were required to complete online educational classes, right? After some pressing, John admitted that rather than taking the courses, he had his managers sign off on them on his behalf. I guess um, I'm going to be honest with you, I never did that. Seriously? Because in 2015, you certified that you did. In 2016, you certified that you did. So now you're saying that you actually didn't? Correct. I see. I had my management do it for me. John's excuse for this being that since he and his team had never considered any cheating options, he just had his manager sign them for him. In general, John did make some points here that were pretty reasonable. He had been tested since he was a child across a variety of sports and levels of competition. He had been competing in the UFC for almost 10 years without issue. Also, it would be pretty stupid to throw his legacy away by taking steroids on a day he knew he would be tested. Don't you guys think achieving all those things, I would, if I was a steroid guy through all these great achievements, I would have been caught a long time ago. It's like, and in my situation, like, why would he do steroids one week before his fight? This kid's been winning since day one. Why would he do steroids? So. That being said, when the commissioners pressed John on the ways he had tried to change since some of his past mistakes, like the hit and run or dick pill incident, John fumbled. Aside from mentioning the fact that he talked to kids in Albuquerque, as part of his court-ordered community service, I'll remind you, in trying to better himself in his personal life, John really whiffed on anything specific. Examples of things I've done to just... To better yourself. To better myself. Man, it's hard to explain because, I mean, outside of doing drunk mistakes, I, I don't really look at myself as being this evil guy that's walking around hurting innocent people and... and, and uh, I've just matured a lot. I've just matured a lot. Even when pressed on whether or not he understood the impact that his actions could have on his opponents, John pivoted to his own legacy, and the fact that he didn't want to be somebody who tarnished the reputation of the sport. I understand that I'm kind of, right now, becoming as one of the pioneers of my sport, could be the, one of the originators of boxing, the way people look at, you know, some of the old greats, the Willie Peps and the Jack Johnsons and all this stuff. I understand how you important. Do understand you are smart. Yes, I do understand, and that's why I would yeah. not disrespect myself in MMA at its, at its birth state by being a cheater. As I said, this hearing is three hours long. I could go on and on about all the details, but we will be here forever. If you really want to get into the John Jones deep lore, though, I would suggest watching the full three-hour video posted on the MMA Weekly channel. Just put it on in the background instead of a podcast one day. After hearing closing arguments from both sides and a bit of discussion on what exactly the penalty for Jones should be, the commission voted on the motion to fine John $205,000 and revoke his license in the state of California. Chairman Corbell. Aye. Vice 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 Chair
Vice Chairman Lady. Aye. Commissioner Frierson. Aye. Commissioner Senior Kidez. Aye. Commissioner Salmon. Aye. Commissioner Dr. Lady. Aye. Six zero, sir. Regulations passed. The motion passed six to zero. When the hearing was over, John released a statement on Twitter thanking the CSAC for hearing his case and Executive Officer Andy Foster for saying he believed in him. Still, even with the CSAC hearing out of the way, there was still USADA to deal with, and we wouldn't learn the outcome of that case for nearly another seven months. Chapter 15. A Short Intermission During the period while John was waiting for USADA to render their decision, he mostly busied himself by beefing with other fighters, like Misha Tate, Chuck Liddell, Tyson Griffin, and Colby Covington. He had actually been beefing with Covington since late 2017, when John praised Fabricio Verdum for hitting the racist Covington with a boomerang. I don't think it's really pertinent to discuss all of John's social media side quests, but I will talk about one particular skirmish he had, because it led to one of the most memorable quotes in the entire John Jones saga. In the wake of the UFC 223 incident where Conor McGregor flew across the Atlantic and threw a trolley at a bus, UFC lightweight Tyson Griffin tweeted that Conor was going to lose his Burger King deal faster than John lost his Nike deal. This obviously caused Joan to fire off a series of tweets, where he said it was his dream to be sponsored by Nike since he was in high school, then facetiously asked what happened to Griffin's Nike deal. Then he called Griffin a bitter bitch the size of his dick. When a fan questioned the logic of this response, John said that the last part was more for him, and he thought it flowed nicely, though whether he meant the tweet or his dick remains uncertain. The beef cooled off for a few days, until Tyson reheated it on April 10th by saying that he took a jab at Connor, but John was trying to make this all about him, and apparently it's too soon to joke about his Nike deal. Griffin then leaked a direct message from John that he had been sitting on for two years. I want you to imagine John typing this out. Quote, Tyson. I'm sitting on about 8 million cash, I have 2 million in real estate, I won the UFC belt 9 times, I'm internationally famous, I'm 6'4", you on the other hand, I'm guessing 5 feet flat, I'm guessing with a net worth of 100,000, never won any titles, can walk around without anyone giving a fuck who you are or what you do. My point is, you and I as UFC athletes are not even close to being the same level. I'm guessing that's why you are constantly attacking me. It's understandable. You're literally and figuratively like a boy compared to someone like me. I'm actually questioning myself as I'm writing this, thinking, why am I even giving you the time of day? Every time I turn around you are writing me some bullshit. Why do you try so hard to get my attention?" End quote. As seen in the screenshots, Tyson replied to John by claiming he was just asking a genuine question about tainted supplements, and saying that he remembered the day he met John, but John left him on red. Griffin followed this up by thanking John for all the hate, aka love, and saying, we are all one. Later that day, John replied with one of his most devastating social media attacks. Quote, It's hilarious that you reposted our private messages. I meant every word I said. At first I thought your hatred was DC related, but now I'm starting to think you were just an envious little bastard. At the end of the day, I'm not going to lie, it's pretty fun shitting on you. Just because I'm the bigger man doesn't mean I have to sit back, be quiet, and listen to your cyber attack. Hope this has gained you a few more followers. I'm sure you will reply to my last message. Be quiet for a while and come out with more hatred in a few more months. It's your pattern. You're cute, my little pet. Kiss emoji. Last thing, don't call me brother. My brothers are over six feet and champions. Hitting me with that soft shit after getting verbally body bagged? Stop throwing tomatoes from the sidelines, bro. You're whack. End quote. You won't often catch me siding with John Jones, but I have to agree with him here. Tyson did get verbally body bagged. I actually feel kind of bad for the little fella, but he was the one who chose to kick the hornet's nest. Naturally, John was also beefing with Daniel Cormier, even while awaiting the decision from USADA. In June, the UFC Twitter account posted a tweet asking if DC was in the GOAT conversation. John responded by saying, If he's in the conversation, does that make me the motherfucking man? When CBS Sports reached out to Cormier for comment, he compared John to Lance Armstrong. He's a nobody, Cormier said. He has been suspended again. He's mired in controversy for drug abuse. Your issues are tied to steroids, performance enhancers. You don't get a platform when you're like that. It's like me glorifying Lance Armstrong." End quote. For reasons that should be obvious by now, this caused John to fire off several tweets in response, saying that every one of DC's wins goes on his resume, and that even DC's wife knows who Daniel dreams about at night. Apparently the taunts worked because Daniel responded with an unusually low blow. Quote, John, you're a bitch. <laughs> you're one now, always been one. Sit back and watch me be great, you steroid cheat. Let's not talk about wives, man. Come on. I'm sure with all the shit you've done, I could get a conversation from your wife. 
I mean your girlfriend, baby mama, blushing emoji, end quote. Chapter 16. Snitches get reduced suspensions, actually. Finally, on September 19th, after over a year of waiting, it was revealed that through a third-party arbitration, John had been given a reduced suspension of 15 months by USADA, retroactive to July 28th of 2017. But how? The answer is actually pretty simple. John snitched. As the documents explain, John tested positive for a prohibited substance, and unlike his first USADA violation, they could not find the source. Since this was John's second violation, he could have faced a suspension of up to 48 months. But the UFC and USADA have provisions allowing them to reduce the length of a suspension. If an athlete provides substantial assistance to USADA, other anti-doping bodies, or law enforcement agencies. According to the documents from the arbitration case, John provided such assistance, and his period of ineligibility was reduced by 30 months. Of course, we can only speculate on what assistance John provided. His manager, Malki Kawa, denied that John snitched on his teammates and tried to claim that John could have informed on himself. Having said that, USADA came out and clarified what substantial assistance meant. Quote, there are two avenues in 10.6.1 of the UFC anti-doping policy which allow for a reduction in sanctions. One, an individual can get a sanction reduction if he or she provides information that results in USADA or another anti-doping agency bringing forward an anti-doping policy violation against other athletes or support personnel. And, or two, a reduction can be given if the information results in a criminal or disciplinary body bringing forward a criminal offense against individuals." End quote. As I said before, you can come to your own conclusions. Nevertheless, it is funny to remember that John was the one who called Shell Sun in a rat for snitching during his mortgage fraud case. He's a thug. He calls himself the American gangster, and he freaking ratted on all of his friends in that money laundering situation, and he calls himself gangster. That's not gangster. The guy's a straight punk. Then again, John was also the one who bragged about tattletailing and other kids who smoked weed in high school. Now, if you're one of those math whiz kids, you've probably already done the calculations while I was talking and realized that 48 minus 30 is not 15. So where did the additional reduction of three months to John's suspension come from? Well, there is a lot of legalese and precedents mentioned, but the long story short is that even though John and his team couldn't produce the source of contamination, you saw to believe that he had taken some precautions to avoid a situation like this from occurring. Not enough that he was totally without fault, because apparently John took some supplements that weren't third-party verified. But he did enough that they believed this was an unintentional ingestion, so his suspension was reduced by an additional three months. Another tidbit revealed in these documents is the fact that John admitted to using illicit street drugs before and after his fight with Cormier at UFC 214. Subsequently, the documents claim that John recognized that he had an addiction and went into rehab. That's interesting because, as far as I recall, he never mentioned these details during his CSAC hearing. I guess it does fit the pattern of dishonesty laid out by the commissioners in that hearing, though. Ultimately, the way I see it, there are a few possibilities here. I'm not listing them in order of likelihood either. First, is that this genuinely was a contaminated supplement. John and his team did what they thought they could to avoid another incident like the UFC 200 debacle. It was the stars aligning in a one in a million accident. If that is truly the case, then it's one of the most unfortunate circumstances in the history of the sport, and John is one of the unluckiest people in MMA. The greatest fighter of all time had his legacy tarnished and lost 15 months of his career because of a tainted supplement. Something that, while not 100% out of his control, was something he shouldn't have had to deal with. The second possibility is that John was intentionally using Terinobol. You have to be realistic. This was John's second incident of a tainted product. What are the odds of that? What are the odds that another fighter managed by Malki Kawa, Frank Mir, would also test positive for Terinobol, only a year prior to John? But maybe that's just a coincidence. Side note, and one of the funniest excuses ever made in MMA, Mir tried to suggest tainted kangaroo meat as a possible source of his violation. Also, while it's circumstantial, it's worth noting just how often John talked about feeling like he was in the best shape of his life leading up to UFC 214. He was having his easiest weight cut. He was training four times a day. And while the eye test isn't always valid, this was the most jacked and diabolical John has ever looked in his career. But again, maybe that is a coincidence. If it wasn't, and John did intentionally take a banned substance, then he's one of the luckiest people in MMA. 
he would have managed to get off with a relatively light punishment compared to what was looming over him. In the process, he managed to convince a significant portion of the MMA fanbase that he was the victim of happenstance and hypersensitive PED tests. But there is a third possibility. Something in between intentional and unintentional. John's team submitted between 15 and 18 different supplements, as well as two massage creams. I imagine if they had any theories about any other source of contamination, they would have submitted those too, like they did with the dick pill. Nothing turned up. That said, the CSAC laid out a pattern of underreporting and, frankly, fraud. We know John has a history of not declaring substances he's taken. We can only guess at what he might have taken and simply been unable to produce for testing. The fact he continued to take certain unknown illicit substances even after the tainted dick pill incident is another major issue. John can dismiss the idea that he took PEDs by saying it would be stupid of him to do roids when he knew he was going to be tested, but it's also stupid to ingest chemicals of unknown provenance when you've already had your career put in jeopardy once for that exact reason. I think Daniel Cormier said it best when talking about this very hypothetical. There were a lot of reasons as to why it point to him doing stuff like that. I mean, I've explained it time and time again, Ariel, a guy that will do cocaine a month before the, big, uh, before the biggest fight of his career yeah, yeah. at the time. Nuts. I'm not judging John for doing whatever he did. It's his life, and unlike him, I'm not a narc. But it shows how reckless he still was, even after he nearly had his career derailed multiple times. At what point does carelessness or recklessness become negligence? When should somebody be held accountable for their negligent behavior? I'd argue it's when your behavior starts to affect others. You can say that the amount of Turinabal metabolites that were in John's system when he beat Daniel Cormier wouldn't have enhanced his performance. Maybe that's true. Unfortunately, it still changed the outcome of the fight. Cormier still has a no contest on his record. He got brutally knocked out in front of millions of people, but he doesn't even get the benefit that a clean defeat would normally provide. I think there is a tendency among MMA fans to look at the feud between John and DC, even years later, and view DC as a sore loser, or someone who can't let go of the fact that he lost to Jones. In my opinion, what people are mistaking for animosity or sour grapes is actually a lack of closure. Let's go back and look at the timeline again for a minute. When Daniel fought John back at UFC 182, he was just only two months younger than John is now. Even for a world-class athlete like DC fighting at light heavyweight, 36 is pushing the end of your prime. In retrospect, that is probably why he was so upset when John pulled out of UFC 200. DC himself said that this particular fuck up by John hurt. This one stings. You know, this is not, this is not easy to deal with. He was probably as close to peaking as he would ever get again during the remainder of his career. And then he had his second chance ripped away from him. Physically and athletically, he was only going to decline from this point. In fact, DC's age was such an obvious point that both men spoke about it during the lead-up to UFC 214. In the years leading up to their rematch, DC had also suffered multiple injuries, including the knee injury he took with him into their first fight at UFC 182. DC most likely knew that if he was going to win a rematch with Jones, his window was closing quickly. But due to John's recklessness and various personal failings, DC was forced to sit around and watch whatever was left of his prime trickle away while the cut to 205 became increasingly more difficult with time. I wish we didn't have so many start stops. You know, I, of course I would have loved to have fought John again when I was 36, but... We can all laugh at the absurdity of John saying DC looked like a crackhead in a suit, but he was clearly having a difficult weight cut leading up to the rematch. When they finally fought again at UFC 214, 22 events, and nearly a thousand days later, DC got brutally KO'd. Only for John to piss hot again, turning the fight into a no contest. DC didn't even get the benefit of a clean loss because John had to muddy the waters with all of these questions. Just think about how that must feel. It takes time to get over these things and when you start to come around, the last thing you want to do is be sucked back into the situation that you're trying to overcome. So it was tough, you know, it took a day. I felt sick, you know. I was... You have to spend the rest of your life wondering what if. Was this guy really using PEDs? And if so, how would the fight have gone differently without them? It's like an open, festering wound that can never heal. Sometimes an amputation would be the better option because it can provide you with closure, with a way forward. Had DC lost John with no controversy, it probably would have been something he could have moved on from more easily. But instead, there will always be uncertainty. 
a wound that will never heal. I just don't I just don't know that uh, there will be time because at the end of this process, if there is no suspension, I will have run out of time, Ariel Hawani. And the thing is, I could go on and on about their feud for hours. Technically, I already have. I've devoted two and a half videos to it, the equivalent of a feature length film, because it's one of the most significant feuds we've had in the history of the sport. Even after John was given a 15 month suspension by USADA, these two went right back after each other. To greater and lesser degrees, this feud is still unresolved. Their legacies are intertwined at this point. It's almost impossible to think of Jones without Cormier and vice versa. Who knows what their legacies would have looked like without the other as a foil. In the build up to UFC 214, Cormier made a fairly interesting point about being able to deny John the redemption he was seeking. Uh, the beauty in this situation is that I get to be the person that doesn't allow for the ultimate redemption. While the story did not play out exactly as Cormier predicted, their rematch at UFC 214 did ultimately deny John the redemption he was looking for. It changed the course of his career and the perception of him as an athlete forever. For the third time, John was forced into an involuntary hiatus from the sport of MMA during the heat of his athletic prime. He only fought twice in nearly four years since beating Cormier at UFC 182, and all he had to show for it was an unremarkable win over Ovin St. Preux. He had lost his belt three times by this point, and there were a significant number of MMA fans who believed him to be a cheater. His redemption was denied. His legacy was tarnished. And after all of that, it still wasn't over. As always, I want to thank you for watching the video, as well as liking, commenting, and subscribing. If you would like to support the channel, you can become a channel member or support me on Patreon. And I have super comments now too if that's the direction you'd like to go in. I'd also like to give a special thank you to my supporters on Patreon who help make these videos possible. Thank you. Pancho Villa, Chris Davies, Brady, Jonas Namanson, Rusty Shackelford, Jackson, Fightback CBD, Mike Robals, Bone CK, Laziest Man on Mars, Skunk Ape, Lucky Buddha Beer, There Are Rice Flakes in the Beer, Random Candor, Fuzi Eunice, Dot Old Neon, Timothy Lee Peterson, Julius Caesar Has Jungle Fever, Ellie, Firebrand, Quasi, Snepsts, I Said No Cops, Alex, and Neem.